Good evening, everybody. My name is Vicky Cowling, and I'd like to begin this evening by introducing um, a welcome to country and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. Um, welcome to the webinar, Managing Children's Aggressive Behaviours in Primary Schools, and to our currently um, 365 registrants from around Australia. It's great to have you all on board, and you are from all corners of this country, Perth and North Queensland, um, Brisbane, and everywhere else. Um, let us know where you're from, because it's great to see the diversity of the geography. Um, this webinar tonight is run by Kids Matter and we welcome the Kids Matter, health and community professionals and primary school audiences. And the case study that is the focus of tonight's discussion has been circulated so we hope you've had an opportunity to read that. My name is Vicky Cowling and yeah, I'm a psychologist and social worker in Melbourne and I have a private practice with children and families. Um, I'll introduce the panel and then we have some ground rules for tonight and move into um, presentations by our panellists, Paul Shelton and Nerida Kinross-Smith. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Paul, who is a teacher and a consultant who has worked um, in a broad range of roles in Australia and abroad. And Paul, I noticed from your um, biography that you done a, did a master's in project about um, kind of readiness and confidence teachers have mm. in working with children who present with aggressive behaviours and I guess that was very informative for what you found about, about how confident people feel but also how it can inform future teachers as well. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Great. And Nerida, welcome. Um, Nerida works in a school-based psychologist. And um, Nerida, reading your biography, I imagine that it's um, very stimulating working with the diverse groups that you do work with, um, parents and teachers and school support staff and community-based practitioners. So um, uh, that's just a kind of an observation I have, I suppose, about your, your role and how stimulating that work would be. Yeah, never a dull moment. Never a dull moment, <laughs> always lots going on. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Now just moving into our ground rules um, for tonight. Um, yeah, you, if you find the chat box too distracting, you can minimise that by clicking on the down arrow at the top of the chat box. But you are also welcome to use the chat box to interact with one another and have some fun with it. Um, and after the presentations by Paul and um, Nerida, there'll be an opportunity to ask them some questions. So I think that's... And also, please stay online at the end of the session for um, an exit survey because it's very useful to um, Kids Matter and Mental Health Professionals Network to receive your feedback. Now, our learning outcomes tonight are how to better understand aggressive behaviours can present in primary school children, strategies to help reduce them and support positive behaviours in the school setting, and um, extend participants' knowledge about working collaboratively with family, school staff, and so on. Um, the case study is an open-ended case study and describes Mr. Adams, who is a grade four or five teacher, who has two students, Sam and Muhammad, who display aggressive behaviours towards the teacher, the learning assistant and other students. And we hope that um, you do gain some useful information from the following presentations. So my, I have three or four overheads to just start things off. This is a definition more of aggression than anger. Um, but aggressive, aggression is the feelings of anger that people may have, um, antipathy resulting in hostile or violent behaviour, a readiness to attack or confront. And I suppose that raises the question of is anger always accompanied by aggression or does um, feelings of aggression always lead to anger. So interesting questions there. Um, 
the sort of behaviours that I guess most of you will have seen or be familiar with that may be seen in primary school children and they threaten physical or verbal behaviour towards students or teachers or other staff, throwing things with the intention of harming, yelling abuse at students or teachers, mocking others and calling them names, antagonising others so they react physically or verbally or using technology to bully or undermine another child, using um, their iPads or their iPhones or other technology they may have, even in primary school, that, that occasionally happens. And why do children behave this way? Um, they might want, might want attention, they might feel left out for some reason, they might be learning problems and that's a way of seeking attention for those. Confidence may be an issue, feeling inadequate, taking revenge um, on a child in some way you know, by using their iPad or their phone to um, wreak revenge on another child they're upset with and displays of power of course. And the possible origins of some um, aggressive behaviour could be obviously a mix of all of these and that's where I guess assessment comes in, a detailed assessment of a child in the background. So possible cultural influences may arise from migration or resettlement. The, the environment, the community a child and family lives in is it a, a kind of a violent or deprived community. Um, for influences in the family, low socioeconomic status, poverty, unemployment, ill health, physically or mental ill health, history of family violence. And the child, him or herself, may have developmental, neurological, cognitive or temperamental issues. Um, so I'll just ask if there are any questions or comments um, about any of that before we move on to um, Paul. So somebody's just saying there's aggressive behaviour from parents and trying to give them feedback and the parents try and shut the participant down. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll move along um, to Paul. If you go ahead with your presentation now, please. Thanks, everybody. No problem. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is uh, to suggest that uh, when faced with challenging behaviour, and in fact uh, ideally well before that, um, we actually need to just take a moment to check our assumptions around behaviour, particularly this idea of challenging behaviour. Now I'm not suggesting that this is what we should do when faced you know, in a playground. Obviously you need to make sure people are safe and you need to follow the rules that are set. But it's really important that we actually take some time to reflect on, on what we're thinking and our own sort of baggage and assumptions that we carry because if we don't then we can quite easily fall back into concepts of uh, control or punishment and those sorts of uh, you know, comments that you hear about, oh, I shouldn't be allowed to get away with that. Um, and, and to really uh, not, I guess, or to, to not adopt what I would like to call a, a behavioural growth mindset really the idea that, that uh, students can develop and that schools are fantastic at teaching, um, op offering opportunities for new models and offering opportunities for students to try, potentially make mistakes, but also but grow. Um, so a couple of assumptions. Uh, in my experience and working with schools, um, behaviour is very rarely intentional or planned, uh, yet you know, sometimes you hear this person is deliberately doing this to me. Uh, it's also not personal. The idea that behaviour is, is isolated and random is another assumption that I think we really need to, to, to look at and whilst I've heard very frequently that you know, this just happened, uh, to me that uh, suggests that we haven't really done a very good job at, at tuning in to what happened beforehand or what happened after um, and how that's interacting with the behaviour and the better we can get with that, the more we can actually tune into those uh, precursors or antecedents and the smaller behaviours before we get to these big behaviours. So I've just got a couple of those ones and, and my, I guess, uh, the learning task test, if you like, of that idea of if uh, a mistake was made or an error was made in an academic situation, would your response be the same to an error that's made in a behavioural situation? And that our, our job is really to, uh, to try and encourage students to become aware and to practise better models into how to make decisions. Not to say they should have a, you know, 
uh, no holds bar, you know, get a jail free sort of card. They have to take responsibility, but responsibility for their choices. So step one, check our assumptions. Then I've really gone through, I guess, a, a process. I, I love a process. Um, and this is made up of, uh, I guess, three different sections. The first is that behavior um, is uh, almost always functional. It, it doesn't just happen in isolation. It almost always serves a, a function or is a communication. And that communication relies on what happens beforehand in terms of the, the academic work, the social situation, um, the, what the class is doing, what you as a teacher is doing, what the wind is doing, all of those situations add to what the actual action or behaviour is. And that action or behaviour has a consequence. Now that consequence may be something that uh, you do, it might be something that the student gains, it might be avoidance, it might be escape, it might be reward. But actually tuning into what that functional communication or even just asking what we think that functional behaviour uh, communication is, is a really important step in, in sort of trying to, I guess, unpick where that behaviour exists. Along with that, there's also a dynamic. Uh, whilst we tend to think about the child, the child is just in a dynamic um, that is influenced by a whole heap of things. As I said, you know, the, the class, the peers, the work, habits and experiences they've got. In, in uh, Muhammad's uh, situation, uh, he's influenced by the aid. Uh, maybe in Sam's situation, there's, there's influence around expectations and models that he's playing with. Uh, anyone who's ever taught a, a year nine class on a really windy, a hot, windy day knows that the dynamic is really important in uh, influencing the behaviour. And also there's this uh, internal narrative, you know, thoughts and feelings that go along with this behaviour that the student may not be aware of. So part of our role is to actually uh, shine a light, if you like. So I've been just gone through, I guess, a little process that I go through in working with schools. Um, safety is number one and assumptions is number two. But then I'm really encouraging people to be the detective. Now, I won't go through all of these, but in all of these situations, thinking about the function, the situation, uh, the thoughts and the feelings that might go along with these, um, these behaviours is really important. And that little symbol in the middle is just to suggest that while the, uh, the student is in the middle, they are part, always part of dynamic. So you can see a couple of, th a couple of things there. And as you go through these questions and, and ask yourself what you do know, uh, very quickly things pop up that we don't know. So for example, uh, we know that uh, Muhammad and, and Sam are in grade four and five respectively, which means that uh, we have four or five years of, uh, of history. So once we have written down what we do know, we then need to ask ourselves what we don't know. So in this uh, situation, um, in, in this case, I'll just pick out a couple of things for Muhammad. So he's in grade four, so it means we've got four previous years. What's happened in those four previous years? What have teachers tried? Has this behaviour been consistent or has it just changed recently? What are the strategies? What are the connections? We know that Muhammad has uh, some academic challenges. So is there any testing around Muhammad, uh, particularly around his sort of language difficulty? It's interesting to see that he has a response to adult figures um, and that this is almost like a escalates the, the, um, the challenge. So one of the questions that I'd want to ask is, are there any adult figures who don't elicit this reaction? Are there any adult figures who Muhammad has a trusting relationship with? And this is really important because this then starts to inform what our planning might be around how we can support Muhammad. I've also put another one down there about what does the behaviour feel like? Now this might uh, sound a little woo-woo, but um, it's kind of important to tune into what, when they're having this situation, and this was in response to him throwing himself on the, on the floor, does it feel provocative? Does it feel hopeless? Or does it feel like he's sort of overloaded and full? And that's really important because it, that again, informs us about what we could potentially do. Now, all of those questions for Muhammad, we would equally ask about Sam, but in Sam's situation, there's a couple of things also. It refers to younger children. I'd be interested to know whether Sam has any siblings or whether it's always young children that are the focus of his aggression. Um, if, the other thing that uh, jumps out for Sam, is that he's very social and he's engaged with a lot of social situations. So how is the school working with his friends, with his peers? And is there actually a social emotional program to actively and explicitly teach the skills of how to get on with people? Because clearly he's running from a, a maladaptive model, if you like, of how to uh, get on with people. And the last step is how do we make a plan about that? So First step, involve the social ecology, and you can see them there. For Muhammad, it would be really important to try and find whether there's any other staff who are trusted. For Sam, obviously the mother and 
question mark, question mark, question mark, depending on the situation, depending on safety, depending on a whole heap of things, of the father potentially as well. Um, because if he could actually communicate that this is, this is not a good way of, of being, that would be very powerful for Sam. Um, and then just to think about how we're going to structure that, how we're going to support. Now, I won't go through those, but that the point that I will highlight is that when you're making a plan, make sure it's clear, make sure it's consistent, make sure it's predictable, and make sure it's shared across the school with the parents and with the students. Um, because they're all parts of that ecology, and only by doing it together can you actually um, make this powerful. The last point I'll make, because uh, I think my time's running out, is to, once you've made a plan, plan to reflect and amend it and stick to that plan to reflect and amend. One of the things I see very frequently in schools is we make a plan and then we have challenges in that plan and that causes us to quickly uh, alter that plan. I would really strongly encourage people to avoid that because there will be changes, there will be challenges because this is not easy work for staff or for students. We need to make sure we're doing this in a measured way. So set a time to review it and do it at that time. But until that time, keep it consistent and keep it uh, clear, predictable and shared. Um, last thing I'll say is, is this is hard work and it's long work. Um, if somebody promises you they can uh, wave a magic wand and fix it, um, I don't believe them. <laughs> uh, any questions? Yes, yeah, so any questions for Paul from our audience? Do you want me to respond to these? Yeah, sure. There's um, a separate plan. Do you recommend a separate plan for unsafe behaviour? I do. I guess uh, it, one of the things that I would encourage schools to do is to work out what behaviour is uh, completely unacceptable and what behaviour they can live with. Uh, sometimes we, we look at all the behaviour and we say, right, well, we're going to deal with all of those things. If there is unsafe behaviour that the school just cannot uh, accept in any way, I would, uh, I, would, I would focus on that first. Um, if it's unsafe, then yes, yeah, safety is obviously a, a big thing and that, that ups the priority. It might mean that that ecology then has to grow and that you have to expand the people who are going to help. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps the next one, um, I'll address it to you, Paul. Do you think the situation from home is a reason for difficult behaviour? I think that the situation for home, potentially for both of these kids, and for, in fact, everybody, um, the situation that we live in is definitely an influence. Um, I guess in, in involving the sort of social ecology and how we're going to support, let's take Sam for, uh, for example, we need to make sure we're supporting that whole ecology. So we are supporting, potentially supporting mother. There's obviously issues going on in the school. Um, and that's why I've identified that it may well be ne necessary for us to engage a the student well-being leader, a, a, a school psychologist or counsellor. Um, and the question that I've asked around there is, is Sam actually getting any support for this separation that's going on? Because obviously that's going to add tension into the system. So yes, absolutely, the, the family will affect, um, but schools have a fantastic opportunity to actually support that whole ecology, not just think that Sam is there their little bit, but, but they can actually support the whole thing. Yeah. And then relating to the children, um, suggestions on getting children or getting students on board, engaging them, I guess. Um, I, it's a pretty big question. Think, but... Coy, um, ask. I mean, these kids are, these kids are you know, grade four and grade five, so they're, you know, they're, they're fairly, fairly old. Um, there's a couple of things that I would say. I, I would really be searching the school for somebody who Muhammad feels safe with and who can engage. And that might be an old teacher who we had previously. But, some, but I would be asking them, um, but asking them in, in the way that is easiest for them. I certainly, would, if I was talking to Sam, I would be asking him who he'd like to talk to and I would be doing it well away from prying eyes of his friends, colleagues and peers so that you can actually really dig into there. Because, you know, they might not be aware of everything that's going on and why, but they will be able to give you some insight as to what they like, what they don't like, what they need, and ways that potentially you can help. Yeah, okay. So there are various comments to Paul to your presentation, which um, good feedback, yeah. Thank you very much. Nerida, sure. can we move on to you? Sure. Uh, so thank you. If you'd like to start with your comments about Muhammad and Sam. Sure. 
Um, welcome, everybody. I, I certainly agree with Paul in saying that there are no quick fixes here, um, and we could do a whole week's conference about this topic, and we still wouldn't get to the bottom of it. But hopefully, with the strategies that we talk about today, we'll be we'll be looking at lasting outcomes for these two boys. For me, for as a psychologist, the key to looking at the underlying causes for Muhammad and Sam's behaviours is all in the assessment phase. It's eliminating all the possible contributing factors. So in relation to Muhammad, I think of several possibilities, probably on their own or in combination. He may be new to Australia and not yet developed English or been born here, but English isn't spoken at home. So I would investigate his competence in both his mother tongue and English first before I did any other assessment. New concepts and rapid escalation of mood are issues. So if language is not an issue, an underlying learning disorder, perhaps accompanied by ADHD, could be. So I would do a complete cognitive and academic assessment to explore general ability to learn and Muhammad's current levels in literacy and numeracy. There's also the possibility that Muhammad may have autism because he seems to have serious comprehension problems in learning and social situations. There seem to be meltdowns, periods of unprovoked aggression and maybe misreading social cues. So maybe a multidisciplinary assessment for autism might yield some more information. If he's a recent arrival in Australia, Muhammad may be suffering from trauma um, resulting in high stress levels, but also undetected language learning or attention problems can also cause severe anxiety, so we need to consider the mental health side of things. With Sam, I think the underlying causes in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that possibly Sam's basic needs for safety, accommodation, food and clothing, for example, may not be being met. The difficulties in contacting his mother suggest that the family may be in distress and maybe that there's ongoing intimidation of her and maybe even Sam himself um, by the father in spite of the intervention order. It appears that Sam's learned that violence is a way to solve conflict or relieve stress. So we need to clarify the current family circumstances and I think this is where the multidisciplinary team working in collaboration with maybe a social worker or a chaplain and really, really address the need for family support. There's also the possibility of Sam suffering from neglect um, and trauma and related severe anxiety because of his home life, but also underlying developmental issues such as ADHD and or autism, and learning difficulties from the long-term consequences of chronic domestic violence and possibly parental substance abuse and, their, and the effects of these on Sam's brain development. Excuse me, I've just stuffed up the slides there. Um, I'll keep talking because otherwise I'll run out of time. Um, okay, now, now it's Vicky, when I go back to where you... There's Sam. Yeah, oh good, sorry. I've got a square in the way of my arrow so I can't go forward. Okay, here we go. Um, so over the next three slides, I'm just going to give you an overview of um, strategies for managing these behaviours. Even though um, what, what these two boys have in common is that they have great difficulties with emotional regulation. So what we're actually needing to focus on in terms of the classroom is teaching them how to emotionally regulate and giving them lots of opportunities to do that, um, both to increase their sense of control but also for the safety of other students. So on the slide that's currently up, you can see the overview of the worst case scenarios really um, <clears throat> incorporated into an individual learning plan. But what is really required, as Paul alluded to, is a whole school approach to upskilling around behaviour management of these two boys. After all, these two boys are going to progress up the school to different teachers and all staff will deal with them on yard duty. So professional development in learning karma classrooms approaches needs to occur to increase the teacher's understanding of how trauma affects brain development and behaviour, utilising natural consequences for minor incidents and developing boundaries and self-care. There may need to be specialist behaviour support from a visiting teacher or triple S staff may value add. But what we're doing is taking the long view here of re-engaging these boys, without which neither may complete secondary school. Looking at the worst case scenarios, the school obviously does have a duty of care uh, to protect Sam and Muhammad, but also other teachers and, and students. 
it may be that funding support needs to be sought um, so that both can have extra staff dedicated to them. Whatever trauma-informed practice and karma classroom strategies happen should happen alongside the worst case scenario measures so that the teaching staff continue to develop positive and meaningful relationships with both boys together with clear behavioural boundaries. It's often impossible to um, and time consuming to identify triggers for emotional meltdowns. It's much more productive to focus on assisting the students to manage their own reactions better. So the slide that's currently up now is just is a brief summary of what you might see in a karma classroom. So you might see things like relaxation, a values focus, music, physical activity, developing and celebrating strengths, public and private praise, visual scheduling, a downtime corner, and lots of heavy muscle work for working the big muscle groups, which is a really calming thing, especially for boys. So these measures would be in place for the whole classroom and enhance the learning of all students and re reduce the individual focus on Sam and Muhammad. A karma classroom incorporates calming spaces, calming routines and activities, and opportunities for self-reflection and growth in a safe environment. As L.R. Nost said, when little people are overwhelmed by their emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not join their chaos. And that's really what the approach is, um, is all about. So I've provided here um, a table that contains the typical strategies that are used in a learning session in a karma classroom. And you can see when you look at it that it takes quite a lot of planning to think about and you've got to have a list of tools that you can resort to as a teacher quickly um, when situations arise. If you look down the slide you'll notice that, um, especially on the two right hand columns, you'll notice that NAPLAN results and other achievements are really not the focus here. What the focus is is developing relationships between the students and the teacher that are based on respect and understanding that there are also regular opportunities to relax, move around and be diverted for both Sam and Muhammad. Expectations for achievements are realistic. There is praise for effort more than outcomes and they're being taught pro-social behaviours, good values and a given meaningful connection with the teacher through that process. So this is just a really simple example of what you might use um, but could be adapted to any, any kind of situation. Um, and M stands for Muhammad and S stands for Sam. So you can see the different kinds of approaches that you might use with both those boys. In terms of working collaboratively, the team around the learner approach I think is really valuable because everybody has someone to contribute, everything, everybody has something to contribute. Um, it's a practical approach I think with cases as complex as this because critical issues including safety are less likely to be overlooked. In the real world, time constraints wouldn't allow me to complete the assessment processes I've outlined and do home visits to parents. In addition, shared responsibility means I can feel more confident that all the needs of Sam and Muhammad are being addressed. The APS have recently released guidelines on working this way to help your clients and I think these are really fantastic guidelines. Um, you can read them at your leisure. What I would add to these is that it's really helpful to discover who in the group might have ongoing relationships with medical specialists because it can greatly save time asking for documents or appointments. I think really it's the two heads are better than one approach. Um, I think the multidisciplinary team approach is really satisfying for me because there are better outcomes for students. I get to network with some amazing professionals and that then helps me assist other students better as well. So it's a win-win all round. Um, I've also provided a list of resources as well which you can access at the end of this webinar which will be just a, um, a springboard really for your reading and your own professional development in this area. Thanks Vicky. Um, a couple of questions relate to parents um, and I'll read them both out. What if parents do not agree and accept that the child has a behaviour problem? And what actions or strategies can schools and staff use if parents aren't working with the school in relation to their child's behaviour plan? 
So do you have any comments about those? So it's really engagement with and acceptance by parents of issues for their child. Well, if you don't have parental consent, you really have nowhere to go in terms of an assessment process. Um, but in terms of behaviour management, there's nothing to stop uh, a teacher implementing any strategies that they choose in the classroom because it's of benefit to the rest of the class and it, and it meets the school's duty of care. Yes. Um, in terms of um, engaging parents who are reluctant, I think it's a case of chipping away, chipping away and chipping away and making sure that you're really transparent in your processes with them. Um, and it might be the case, you know, particularly if you're dealing with parents with uh, lower intelligence or particularly, you know, chronic social problems, it might be that you need to repeat your, your goals and your desires in this, in this matter with their children several times before they really understand the importance of this. Um, but it is, it is about chipping away and finding whatever you can to establish the best rapport possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess part of that relates to the, the parent as a, and the family, how they feel they belong to the school as a community as well. So there's that more getting to the ecological side of it too. Well, that's right. We're often dealing with parents who have trauma around their own education, yeah. <laughs> um, which makes them difficult to engage particularly because they're scared already before they get there. Mm, yeah, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, okay. Are there any further questions from um, our participants, I wonder, before we move on? Comments about that it, it could be difficult because of just time constraints, but I guess that applies anywhere. Mm. Um, okay, we'll leave it there. So thanks again, Paul and Nerida, for that. Um, now, Paul and Nerida both had a question for one another. So I wonder, um, Nerida, would you like to go ahead and ask Paul the question that you posed for him? Sure. Um, Paul, I would, I would really like to know um, what it is that keeps you passionate about your work with these really challenging students? Um, I guess uh, there's a couple of things. There's probably a, a thing in terms of uh, one of the things, the positive thing sometimes that uh, these challenging students do is actually bring the teaching staff together because you realise that we actually need to work together. Um, so I have a special ed background in, in some, uh, and in some ways the special ed uh, sort of situation is great because teachers actually work collaboratively and help each other. So there's that, that's actually quite a nice place to work. But most of all, um, these kids are amazing. And these kids who struggle through situations that are difficult, I mean you've got Sam with a, a really difficult sort of home life, um, when you can find the thing that makes that kid uh, tick and the thing that really makes them want to engage, they can go from being your, your challenges to your absolute stars. And we've got mm. lots of experience and lots of stories in the media about you know, kids who are really difficult at school and then, then found their thing. And I think there's a great opportunity as teachers and as schools, you know, outward facing sort of schools, um, to, to really to do amazing work. And, and these kids deserve you know, the, the best effort that we can give them. Okay. And in turn, um, Paul, you had a question for Nerida. And, and uh, Nerida, you've actually <laughs> answered a lot of this, but uh, as, a sort of, as a psychologist working with schools in a sort of more therapeutic way, uh, what sort of pre-work or, or information or data would you like? You know, when you walk into a school, what, what makes you think that this school is, is on top of it and this intervention is going to really work out to help you do your work? I guess... Um, the speed with which they bring the, pro the problem to my attention is a good indicator of how keen they are to get on board and do something for a student. But in, in terms of background information, it's really helpful for me to know um, a, how easily it was to get parental consent. <laughs> if parental consent was a difficulty, then we can be sure that we're going to have to take things very slowly. In terms of background information from the teacher, things like um, descriptions of the behaviours that are a problem and what's been tried already uh, with the child, whether those strategies have worked or not. Um, the number of previous schools the student's been at um, gives an indication of whether they've moved around a lot, whether there's been a lot of instability and perhaps inconsistency in being able to consolidate their learning. Um, 
what the what the teacher and the school's understanding of the family situation is, um, whether there are any underlying medical conditions. Um, all these background bits of background information are really useful for me in doing what you were talking about, really, Paul, putting putting the situation into a context so that I don't make any unwarranted assumptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you both. There's been a number of questions um, coming up just in the last 20 minutes or so and also in the questions submitted before the webinar about self-care for teachers looking after themselves and um, you know, ma managing their own responses to being treated aggressively. And I wondered if either of you would have any comments about that, how that can, maybe it can't be prevented, but how they kind of manage that, seek support, etc. I think if, um, if teachers implement the Karma Classrooms processes and build into their classroom routines regular relaxation or meditation or exercise, um, any of those things that, are, that we know are good for regulating a nervous system that's under stress, the teachers stand to benefit from those measures as well as the, as well as the students. And I think yeah. it, it creates a, a classroom culture that um, encourages students to be able to be vulnerable when they need to be uh, and to be able to express their needs more openly so there's less guesswork going on. Um, and it allows teachers, I think, also to show to the students that how to, they're modelling for them how to manage their stress you know, further on into their lives. So yeah. I think there, there are benefits from that. But I think um, teaching is such a demanding job these days. I, I just am full of admiration for teachers. Um, and I think it's, it's about being able to... Um, monitor your own stress levels and be humble enough to seek help when you know you need it um, and, and not to take that as a, an indication that you're not coping or that you, you know, you're losing it. It's, it's just about being realistic in today's workplace as a teacher in my opinion. Sure. Okay, thank you. I'd just add that the school has, has a bit of an opportunity there to, to normalise that idea of help seeking. Um, I, I completely agree uh, that uh, it, it's, it's really tough and this can be really personally exhausting dealing with, with these kids. Um, I guess a couple of things that, that, that maybe uh, a slight sort of uh, to, to take the weight of that a little bit. Um, it, it's rarely about you as a person. Um, it's sometimes about you as a role. Um, and that the kids who really don't like a person won't turn up. Uh, there's a really good reason that these kids turn up. Uh, it's because you actually give them something and the school gives them something that maybe they're not getting at, at home. Mm -hmm. um, but really, to, yeah, to look after your own thing, to not... Uh, if things are tough, then ask for help. And, and I don't think, as I said, this, this doesn't happen fast. Uh, it, it, there is no silver bullet and it shouldn't be done alone. It should be a team effort uh, and that should be proactively put in place before things start getting tough, not, not when things start getting tough. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we're looking at some of the questions um, that came through before the webinar began. Um, yes, how, this kind of, it's all, rel all relates of course. How do you help students um, feel safe? You know, we're thinking of the, the whole classroom. So how, do, how do we help students feel safe when there's an aggressive child in their classroom? Are there particular strategies that can be um, adopted in that situation? Would you like to go first, Paul? Sure. Um, look, the, if, if children are feeling unsafe, then that's a really big, you know, that's a big red flag. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the first thing is very practical things. Um, feel very, uh, very sort of supported and uh, don't double guess yourself. If you think people are feeling unsafe, then remove the child from the, from the class or remove the class from the child um, because children do have a right to learn in a, in a safe environment. I would say that my experience is that uh, if children are really feeling unsafe, that, that's actually fairly rare. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, everybody talks about it and the whole school knows this one situation where that happened. Um, but we can do a lot of good by, by actually tuning in and, and supporting these students well before we get to that point of, of it actually being a, an unsafe situation. The school has a duty of care to, to maintain safety. Um, so there's no real ifs or buts about that. If, if there is a, a situation that is unsafe, that needs to be dealt with. 
I would say though, in dealing with it, try and deal with it neutrally. Um, you know, you are being unsafe. You need to move. Um, you know, we need to do this. Um, I'm not doing it because you. I'm not. I'm not angry. I'm not getting counteraggressive. This is what's going to happen uh, in in a calm, neutral. But follow the steps that the school will have. Okay. Anything you'd like to add to that, Nerida? Uh, there are some group programs around that um, come at it from a different angle, I guess, uh, more from the point of view of teaching appropriate social skills. Um, into things like TheraPlay and um, Lego therapy, and um, they're the two that spring to mind quickly. Um, and even some language building programs do it as well. And certainly a lot that are targeted towards children with autism. Um, some of those approaches can be incorporated as well, so that so that the um, prob the, the the aggressive students can see what is actually being asked of them. It's, it's always such a difficulty for them if they're not seeing it modelled well at home. Um, they're not actually quite sure how they're supposed to be behaving. And, so, and because they can't regulate their own uh, emotions well, um, to be told that they're not behaving appropriately but then not to be instructed in how to behave appropriately leaves a big gap for them. They just continue to be baffled. Um, so, yeah, it's... It is about thinking about the individual student, I think, too, but also about how you might incorporate um, some social skills instruction into the interventions that are used. And I guess that goes back to, to parental involvement as well, um, having parents engaged, um, parents being willing to take advice and suggestions and do homework with the child about the child regulating his or her emotions. So that's kind of part of that equation, yeah. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And somebody has just... Yeah, go on, add, go ahead. Sorry, can I just add that um, the social emotional learning aspect uh, which Nerida was talking about is, is absolutely crucial uh, and is crucial not just for, for the one kid that everyone's talking about but actually for the whole school um, because mm. everybody is modelling those schools and e skills and everybody is... is uh, offering opportunities for those to be practiced and generalized uh, and given feedback then then that's really powerful so we're, we're not just teaching the skills we, we're teachers are fantastic at explicitly teaching things um, and this is one of the things that we really need to be explicitly teaching generalizing and offer, offering opportunities for practice so a whole school approach really to um, basic kind of respect and behavior towards one another which is a big ask, I guess, yeah. Um, somebody's asked about um, aggression in the playground and how managing that, I mean, the fact we've talked about kind of more classroom approaches, I suppose, but picking up at, you know, lunch times and play times and one somebody said that the biggest problem is children who attack one another in the, um, outside in the yard, in the schoolyard. So any reflections on that issue? Paul, I see you nodding your head. Would you like to... Make a Look, it's, it's really common and if you think about it, uh, you know, you've got a less structured environment, you've got lots more people, you've got lots more things going on, there's balls, there's wind, there's all sorts of uh, um, different situations. Uh, for a kid who has difficulty, um, you know, regulating what's going on, understanding social cues potentially, who doesn't have a good model about how to engage and play productively with other people, Playgrounds become a very, very difficult place. I guess uh, what I would say is that you need to be aware of when that happens and to try and to ask those questions about why that happens and then how you can modify either the, the situation or the environment um, to support that kid. Uh, but I think that idea of support is really important. But what our real aim is to try and find a way that this kid can uh, make friends, play with friends in, in a way that mm. they feel rewarded. I think sometimes we, we look to how can we control this aggression and I think that, that leads us down a little bit of a, uh, a, a danger, not a dangerous path, but a, a questionable path, let's say. So how can you support the student? How can you modify the, the situation? How can you, you know, decrease the number of social cues? How can you decrease the sort of visual noise or the audio noise? How can you give them some opportunities or some structures so that they can succeed and practice those social skills in that situation. 
And I think your um, overheads about karma classrooms now are appointed to specific strategies that may be useful there for some children. Mm. Like having them having them do tasks where they feel that they you know there's positive feedback for them about doing something and contributing in some way in the school. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, I've known teachers that have sent. Uh, just to get kids moving that need to move to relieve their stress levels. I've known known teachers to send students to the principal with a note saying, "Hold this student here for ten minutes and then send them back." You know, it's to get it's it's about yeah. breaking the dynamic. I think in in lots yeah. of situations, and that might be the case in the playground as well. Um, you know, obviously separating the students that are um, that are being attacked from the one doing the attacking, but um, you know, it might be about zones in the playground for a period of time. Um, it might be about sending sending the aggressor around the oval a few times. It's about you've got to be creative, I guess, is what I'm getting at here, and to know the child well enough to know what's going to work. And it's trial and error to begin with, without a doubt. Um, it's also can you know, in terms of the social skills modelling and so on, it's it's. I've yeah been involved in cases where where children have been restricted from going out into the playground for a period of time until they could demonstrate consistently that they weren't going to to hit or you know be aggressive towards other students. Um, that's you know that's not the ideal approach, but sometimes it's necessary. Yeah. Well, as the whole school safety, I guess at mm. the end of the day, to consider. Mm. Mm. Just on a, quite a different note, um, relating to family violence, this question from someone, how possible is it to assist children who have or are experiencing family violence and its effect on their development without working on the root cause and ensuring healthy home environments? The big question. Paul, would you like to kick that off? Uh, um, Do you want me to repeat reality? the question? No, no, it's just it's such okay. a huge question. It is, um, yes, absolutely. It, but it's very topical, I guess, at the moment. Sure, absolutely. Um, Look, can we control what happens at, at home? Absolutely not. Um, yes. do, in my experience, do parents want the best for their kids? Yes. Do they always know how to do that? No. Do they have bad experiences sometimes with school and education? And do they trust um, structures, bureaucracies? No. Um, so all of those things are, are very much in the can we do anything uh, sort of maybe category. Uh, that said, uh, students often find in school what they don't get at home. Um, and uh, mm. I've definitely worked with a number of students who, you know, home, uh, school is their sanctuary from the things that they don't get uh, at home. So mm. if we can engage those students uh, socially, academically, if we can teach those students to uh, to achieve and to, to reset their own sort of impression about, about what they are and what they want to achieve, then schools can, can work. It's not ideal, but they can work in, in isolation from the, from the family unit. Um, I will say again, it's hard work though, um, but uh, uh, it, it definitely can be done. Um, and it, it involves, yeah, I guess all of those things that we've talked about, you know, structures and supports and uh, that unconditional support from from schools to, to, to give them what they're not getting. Yeah, and I guess what you're saying and what we've said so far this evening is emphasising the incredibly important role that schools and teachers and other staff have in the child's life. Mm. Um, Mary, do you want to add something to what Paul said about that particular question? Uh, look, I, I absolutely agree with what Paul said. I think um, as a teacher, you never want to underestimate the value of being a sane, predictable, warm, consistent adult in a child's life. I think when children are faced with chaos at home all the time, some of them come to school and it's just like they breathe a huge sigh of relief. They finally know that they're in a safe environment and they know and we know that it, probably school is the best thing happening for them. And I think even if you can't fix the problem, of the domestic violence at home, don't underestimate the impact of what you're providing just by being yourself. Mm. Um, you know, I heard a radio program the other day about teachers that had influenced people's lives and people were getting on the, on the phone and talking about 
various teachers that had helped them throughout their their schooling and it was it was incredibly touching to hear mm. what teachers had done and and what a major impact lifelong impact they'd had so i think don't underestimate even though it may be you may be discouraged you may be you know totally um disillusioned with with what you can do don't underestimate the value of what you're offering mm, I agree yes very much so um, another question relates to um, when to actually intervene um, with a child the question is do you have any recommendations on when to seek help at what stage does it go from being a normal developmental behavior to underlying issues and I guess that relates in part at least to assessment, Merida. Mm. I would say intervene when the child is experiencing distress. Mm. Even, if it's, even if from your point of view it's, um, it's subjective distress and not based in anything in reality, I would say if the child is expressing distress, then that's the time to intervene. That's the yeah. time to start a process happening um, and start working out what's going on. Sure. Okay. Paul, anything further on that one? Uh, I, I completely agree with Nerida. I, my yeah. experience is that teachers are pretty, pretty good at knowing when something is up. Um, not always as, as good at knowing how to, where to go to for help. But uh, most teachers, I think, know that you know, this, is, this is not just run-of-the-mill stuff. Um, yeah. And there was another one here about past trauma as well. Um, which also relates to assessment as far as one can do that. But I guess assessment may be difficult if it's just not possible to reach the parents. But the question is, how can we help students heal from past trauma if that is what is fueling the behaviour? So again, um, what merit assessment, again, trying to tease out what has happened for a child before they come to that school or before the behaviour becomes evident. What's yeah, in the family, developmentally, etc. Yeah, that's right. And I think the most valuable skill as a teacher that you can teach a child is how to manage their emotions. Mm. Um, you know, you, you won't be able to fix the trauma. I think it's, yeah. you know, important to be realistic about that. Um, but if you can help them to cope better on a day-to-day -day basis, you've given them an enormous advantage that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, so the, the whole Karma Classrooms, um, uh, you know, rationale is, is built around that. It's about teaching self-regulation um, and assisting children to feel safe with their own emotions. Yes, yeah. And in fact, somebody's commented that teaching emotional competency is crucial in preparing to teach social skills. Mm, absolutely. So their own emotional regulation, yeah. And there's another question as well just in that list about um, the challenging, challenging behaviours may also suggest giftedness. And do either of you have a comment about that? That it's not, yes. not often <laughs> identified or discussed? I, I, I'm not massively comfortable with giftedness just uh, as a right. term, but uh, everybody has, has skills. And uh, yes, I indeed. think of, mm. a, a couple of students who I've worked with um, who you know have ended up excelling because they found their thing, and yeah, often these kids have overcome immense obstacles, uh, and there's a there's a real strength and, and sort of power and potential passion. Uh, so yep, absolutely, it can be a sign of, of a talent or a, 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 a potential. It's about finding that and teaching them a way to access that. Yeah, and I wonder, Nerida, if that comes back to also assessment, uh, you know, educational assessment um, with the child to kind of to get to the bottom of that as well. Oh, absolutely. I've had um, mm. I've, I've had lots of referrals over the years of um, children that have been misbehaving in class, and um, when I've started the assessment, it's become pretty obvious to me that they're right up the top end, and I'll say to them, "Are you bored?" And they say, yeah. yes. <laughs> and one, once we've identified that um, and they're being extended in what they're interested in, then it's just the behaviour settles almost immediately. So boredom is, mm. boredom is just torture to some kids, absolute torture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, time is ticking away, so um, just one last question. Meltdowns can be very difficult to deal with in a classroom setting. Are there any useful strategies 
um, to settle, you know, a meltdown in the classroom. Paul? Um, I, I, there's a saying that uh, I, I heard in the UK that in a, in a stressful situation, the first person that needs to calm down is you. Um, so <laughs> I, I would, yeah, I that's true. That, that in, a, in a meltdown, one of the most important things that you can do is to, to sort of step back and make sure that your brain is firmly in the engaged drive position and, and just, just sort of not try, try and re, uh, resist the, the emotional thing that, that definitely comes at you and we all feel it but to try and just resist that and say, okay, what, what is happening here? What do I need to do for this student, for myself, for the other students? And try and approach it um, in, a, in a balanced and sort of neutral way, even if I'm in the, on the inside you are you know, tumultuous and, and, and sort of yes. uh, escalated. Uh, if kids see you dealing with a meltdown in a, in a calm, neutral, measured way, talking calmly, giving yeah. off options, dealing with things, that, that's amazingly uh, both reassuring for them, reassuring and settling for everybody else, and also educative, you know, that, that there is a better way. Okay, what, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to do it? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, so it could be paddling madly underneath, but you look as cool as a cucumber. Okay. <laughs> There's a skill there. Yeah. Now, look, it is time to start wrapping up. So, Merida, would you have any kind of overall statements, comments about, um, about tonight's session that you'd like to kind of leave us with? Just observations on what you've heard, discussed, and questions you've responded to, as well as your own material. Um, oh, I'd like to say, from what I can read and from what the, the questions that have been asked, there seem to be a lot of um, really concerned and dedicated and... Um, highly uh, people with lots of integrity participating in this webinar which is really encouraging to me. Um, I think it's it's about using the processes that you can research and find out about um, and then practicing them enough so that they become automatic for you and it's like learning any new skill playing the piano you just have to practice it until it becomes automatic for you. And when it is automatic, then you can actually listen to your gut instinct about what this child is trying to communicate yeah. to you. Um, I think, you know, Paul's original point about all behaviour has a purpose is absolutely right on the money. And once you've worked out what the purpose of the behaviour is, you're in a much better position to manage it well. Great, thank you very much. And Paul, any sort of wrap up comments from you? Um, wrap up, I guess uh, what I'd say is to, to contextualise behaviour as part of the whole person and that when you see uh, behaviour, it's not just a, a behaviour but sort of a, a need for, for, for a sort of growth and success mm. identity for, for the student and therein lies the, the educative opportunity to, to really yeah. teach those skills to that student and everybody else. Um, and teachers do more often than not, and in the vast, vast majority, fantastic work and it's hard work. Uh, so um, I think they deserve big credit for, for really mm. caring and trying really hard. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you both very much. And I just think it's what, what's it like to be that child, you know, standing in that mm. child's shoes? What, what, what is that child experiencing? That's what I wonder. So just my observations were the incredible importance of assessment on all levels as far as that can be gained. And that also brings out the issues of knowing what the boundaries are in relation to accessing the family and the parents for the information they can provide or, you know, they may not just not be accessible. And the ecological approach of um, all the different parties involved and the kind of interrelationship between all sectors and groups, the child, the family, the school, the community. Um, so thank you very much, Paul and Merida. Really fantastic presentations and so informative. Um, there's a slide there about Kids Matter at the moment. Thank you all to our participants for your questions, comments and feedback. Um, there is um, links there, Facebook connections and so on for you to follow up. Um, don't forget the exit survey that will come up for you. And the next webinar is on Wednesday the 19th of May and the topic is how reconciliation can support the social and emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So that will be an extremely interesting one. So I'm going to say good night and uh, we finish for this evening. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.